that all of you will go back home and you will be wiser than when you came in because you are going to get some verses in the book of Proverbs. You are going to be known as the book of wisdom. Okay, as you know that Solomon is the principal author of this book or there are others also who contributed to the writing of this book. Now this book, the book of Proverbs, it should be different from the rest of the Bible as it gives us short instructions for living an effective, productive, and a prosperous life on earth. And it should instruct people. It's a part of wisdom and addresses almost every situation or almost any circumstance that we may face in life. And it shows us how to attain practical righteousness and that is by living our lives under the authority and the direction of God. And how do we apply these teachings to our lives? We simply read it, commit it to our hearts, and then live it. Because the teachings that we talk about us are very practical and also very important. This morning I'm sure you believe that we are not going to look at the entire book of Proverbs, but we are just going to focus on one particular topic. And if you have it, I'm going to take a in the Bible to Proverbs chapter 10, verses 19 to 21. Proverbs 10, 19 to 21. And it says, when words are many, transgression is not lacking. In other words, when you talk too much, it's easy to fall into sin. But whoever restrains his lips is prudent or wise. The tongues of the righteous is choice silver. The heart of the wicked is of little world. The lips of the righteous feed many. In other words, it nurtures many. But fools, they die lack of that they die for lack of sense. So this morning my message is focused on speech or how we use our words to communicate. And if you want the title for this, I would say if you can choose your words wisely. Choose your words wisely. Now speech or the Freedom of speech, isn't it? 
But do you realize that speech is the reason for many problems? We say the wrong thing at the wrong time or the right thing to the wrong person. Or we say it in the wrong way. And sometimes we face problems and difficulties because we do not say what we need to say. And Solomon rightly said that death and life is the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18, 21. Of course, it's not speaking about physical life and physical death. But the tongue has the power to destroy or to build. James compared the tongue to a destroying fire, to a dangerous beast, and to a deadly poison. James chapter 3, 5 to 8. Actually, our ability to communicate is a gift from God. Those of you who have children will remember the first word that when the child spoke, he was so proud and so taken up and so excited about it. And when he was a child, he was able to string a few words together and make a sentence. You were extended virtue. The ability to speak seems to come naturally, and that's why we take it for granted. We do not, discuss, we do not even consider that speech is a gift from God, or a miracle from God. You know, a professor by the name of Pinker, Professor Pinker, he made this observation. He said, speaking is not something you actually learn like you learn to read the time and so on. Rather, it is a distinct piece of the biological makeup of our brains. It's a distinct piece of the biological makeup of our brains. In other words, it was our creator's design to make us communicators. God designed us to be those who can communicate because we are made in the image of God who is the God who communicates, amen? amen. And so we have this ability, this wonderful ability to be able to communicate. If you think about it, Adam and Eve, you know, when God first created Adam, I'm sure he gave some instructions to him, or the Bible says he gave instructions about how to live in the Garden of Eden. And he understood. They communicated. And obviously Adam, he communicated this to Eve as well. So they also, even then, they were able to communicate and understand one another. And we know that God, Adam and Eve, they, were, they fellowship together. You know, they had conversations together. And it was a good thing. But then we see how this thing that was meant for good was used to destroy as well. When Satan used words to tempt Eve, to cause her to doubt, to cause suspicion in her mind, to cause pride to set in. And Eve having been deceived, she must have used words to communicate this to Adam, to convince Adam to persuade Adam to disobey God. So this wonderful gift of communication, of communication was used for good as well as for evil. And it is the same today as well. Our words can be used for good or it can be used for evil. James wrote in his epistle in chapter 3, out of the same mouth proceeds Blessings and curses. And he says, brethren, this should not be so. Words can have a tremendous effect on people's lives. One poor lie can destroy a person's life. One malicious gossip can blemish a person's reputation or even ruin his life. We know how friendships, how relationships, and even marriages have been affected because of false malicious talk. The words of an unrighteous judge can either set a guilty man free or set an innocent man to prison. A teacher can make a negative remark on a little child 
and their child's self-confidence can be ruined for most part of his or her life. Let me share something about a dear friend of ours whom we know for many, many years and who's a pastor as well. From a very young age, he loved music. Music was in him. But his music teacher told him that he has no talent and that he will never ever do well in music. So he was disappointed and he was shattered. He suppressed his love for music. But somewhere down the line, I can't remember all the details, he took up music once again. And today, he's one of the best musicians we have ever met. He can, try, he can play any instrument, either by ear or by chords. He composes music as well as songs. And his main ministry today is to build up and raise other worship leaders. One careless word from a teacher could have destroyed all that or robbed him of God's plans and purposes for him. Never underestimate the power of words. But the good news is this. As children of God, we have the power to refute and overcome such words that has been spoken over our lives or over our families. We don't have to be subject to those. You know, we are all excited about the progress of the sanctuary, aren't we? But never forget, church, that the building is only to facilitate the work that God has called us into. And each of you here, each of you, if you call and follow me your family, your spiritual family, then each one of you, all of you are called into this work. And this work will obviously involve people. It's not just God and you, it's people. Ministering to people, ministering God's love to people in various practical ways. And how we use our words will affect and influence our ministry. Because speaking is a vital part of any Christian ministry, communication in any form. So today's message is very basic, it's very practical, but I believe it is very, very important. Speaking, I hope, is something that we will do as long as we are here on earth. Because once we are in the presence of God, once we are gone past from this life, we don't have to bother much about our speech because we are told that everything will become new, including our speech. It will be, more, it will be wholesome then. But as long as we are here on earth, we need to choose our words wisely. We need to know when to speak. We need to know what to speak as well as we need to know when not to speak. So today we are going to consider, first of all, when to keep silent. And husbands don't look so happy because it's not only for the wives, it's for everybody. When to keep silent. Knowing when not to speak is important because keeping silent most of the time is more difficult than talking. And scripture tells us that sometimes it is wise to keep our mouth shut in various situations. We read in Ecclesiastes 3, 7 to 8, that there is a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak. So when should we not speak or when should we keep silent? See, one of the times that we definitely need to keep silent is when we're angry. When we speak in anger, somebody is definitely going to get hurt. And Proverbs 29, 22 tells us that a person who is hot-tempered or gets angry quickly commits many sins. Ephesians 4, 26 tells us, in your anger, do not sin. Oftentimes than not, we are going to regret those words that we speak when we are angry. And even if we apologize, sometimes it's a bit too late because the day in damage has already been done. And those of you who are parents, refrain from being in correction or disciplining your children when you are angry. By all means, discipline your children, bring correction to your children, but wait 
till your anger has passed. Same in every situation we face. When upset, when we're angry, a wise person will always remain silent. And that's why some of us give the silent treatment to certain people. Wise. Proverbs 29.11 says, A fool lets fly with all his temper, but a wise man will remain silent, a wise person will remain silent, and that is because our words, when spoken in anger, is never ever pleasant. Another reason why people's words are unpleasant is because they carry anger in their hearts. They have failed to release forgiveness towards those who have even hurt us, like today we heard that testimony. You know, unforgiveness, envy, covetousness, these are negative emotions. And when we, bitterness, when we harbor these in our hearts, our conversations are never ever uh, pleasant. They'll be always bitter, they'll be always suspicious, they'll be always insincere. And the remedy for this, of course, is to repent, to seek God's forgiveness, and we are needed, release forgiveness. We should, on a daily basis, seek the Holy Spirit, ask the Holy Spirit to search our hearts and see if there's anything that, uh, that uh, grieves Him and to help us to get rid of it. The good news is we can control all our emotions because when we bring our emotions under the subjection of the Holy Spirit and ask the Holy Spirit to control us and help us, then we can always um, uh, overcome these negative emotions. Amen? As I said, silence is sometimes better than speech. You know, there are many times that we need to keep silent apart from when we're angry. For example, we don't have to, we don't, uh, if we don't know the answers, it's better to keep silent. When we don't know facts, it's better to keep silent. It is not necessary to state our opinion on every subject, to have the last word all the time, in every argument, to demand our way in every, every discussion that we have, to defend ourselves from every criticism. Sometimes we just need to keep our thoughts and words to ourselves. It's a wiser thing to do. So the Bible tells us when to keep silent or when not to speak. But it also instructs us what not to speak. And that is because many times words can be used as weapons to hurt people, to harm people. So firstly, we do not speak about another person's sins or their weaknesses or their mistakes in order to expose them. Proverbs 17, 9 says, whoever would foster love covers over an offense but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. And the New Testament tells us that love covers a multitude of sins. What this means is we do not expose the other person's sin to another person by speaking about it. Cover an offense does not mean we ignore sin or cover it up. Rather, in love, we try and restore that person, but we do not speak about it to others. Of course, there will be times that we may have to discuss it with a senior pastor or a leader. For example, if I know of a sin situation within a person's life in this church, and I know it's harming that person or harming the others around them, I may have to bring it to Pastor Maria to see how we can restore this person and protect the rest. And church, I would say that that is the only reason that we would discuss such issues and not to each and every one, but somebody who's senior and spiritually mature and all the time would say your senior pastor. You know, we may not call ourselves or see ourselves as gossips, but the moment we pass on a negative information about one person to another, that is gossip. And this is something the Bible asks us to refrain from. Next, what we should not speak is untruths. Or to put it simply, we should not lie. But we do lie, isn't it? Like Kobe reminded us 
reminded us last week. So we are not surprised. I'm sure we, all, we have all lied. Or we do lie, whether it's often, whether it's rarely, whether it's intentionally, or it's not really intentionally, we always, we people lie. Purposefully omitting certain information where it is required, like when we have to fill out forms and so on. When we omit really information, when we have to give them, that is a form of lying. Little white lies to get some extra benefits, to get a job. These are all lying. Are we always 100% honest all the time? If not, we need to repent and we need to confess. You know, our subtle lying, our little white lies, they may not directly hurt or uh, hurt somebody, but you know what? The Bible says that lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. And that is because as image bearers of God, we cannot live a life that is contrary to his character. Next, the Proverbs, uh, Proverbs tells us or instructs us to refrain from flattery, as this is another form of lying. Proverbs 26, 28, a lying tongue hates those it hurts, and a flattering mouth works ruin. And in Psalm 12, 2 to 3, it says, neighbors lie to each other, speaking with flattering lips and deceitful hearts. So flattery that is meant to harm or intentionally pass on untruths, that kind of flattery comes from a deceptive heart. You know, people flatter with ulterior motives. You know, flattery can be like, you know, saccharine, this artificial sugar. When you take, as soon as you take it into your mouth, it's sweet. But then later on, it leaves a bitter taste in your mouth. And too, of, too much of it can actually make you sick. Unlike truth, which is like honey, it's naturally sweet and also healthy to your bodies. So Proverbs 29, 5 to 6 days says that a person who flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for him to step, step into, meaning our flattering will not always be helpful to people because flattery can, uh, can set a trap for people, meaning we can give them false information about themselves, make them think something wrong about themselves that could, they could make them fall into a trap. You know, when we think something that is not really about ourselves, we can do things in our own strength and then we can fall into a trap. You know, Proverbs also tells us that flattery is used to seduce people and cause them to fall into sin. You know, Satan, he flattered Eve when he said, you shall be like God in Genesis 3, 5. In other words, he was inclined to Eve that she and Adam had some power within themselves to do something that would make them feel like, be like God. And we know how what it ended up. Satan's lies or his flattery caused them to stumble and be separated from God. And the consequence of which we are still facing, isn't it? Even today, there are so many false teachers who teach the people, teach their congregation that they are like God, that they're equal to God. They have the same power as God. I don't have time to go into all this this morning, but they take scripture out of context, and this is false flattery that God can cause people to sin. Yes, God has given us the power and authority to do things in His will, according to His will, and when He wills. Not for us to just claim and, but claim and whatever. Name and claim. There is none that can be able compared to God. God is holy. God is almighty. Even when we stand in the presence of God in all eternity, we will never be equal to him. He's the uncreated one. We will always be his subjects. Back to flattery. Now, I'm not against admiring our place, you know, appreciating people. In fact, we encourage you to do that. I'm sure we all know the difference between true appreciation 
and false flattery. I'm not asking you to be overly conscious when you are admiring somebody or paying compliments for somebody. For example, you go to your friend who's celebrating 50 years and you say, you, uh, you still look sweet 16. You know, this is something we say out of affection and love. You're not fooling anybody. You know, that is called permissible exaggeration, a form of expressing your affection. Or we tell your husband, whom you've been married for over 30 years, darling, you are still as handsome as the first day I met you. Don't look a year older. That's perfect. Okay, it's an expression of our love. What the Bible wants us is this intentionally, intentional flattery with ulterior motives or exaggeration to intentionally deceive or to convey something that is not true. Next. We should also guard our tongues from saying things that hurt and crush people. You know, we may be stating the truth, but we need to check our motives. Why are we saying this? I've heard people boast that they're straightforward and they never hold back in speaking out their minds. You know, such people can be insensitive. You know, someone said it's nice to talk with people who can make a point without impaling anyone on it. Meaning intentionally saying things that are meant to hurt people. By all means, speak the truth. But if you are saying it, if you're not saying it out of love, and if you're saying it to hurt people, then church is better for us to hold our tongue. I read this somewhere, which is so true. It says, love without truth is hypocrisy. And truth without love is brutality. We should never be guilty of either sin. Even if it's a sin situation that needs addressing, if you're not motivated by love, if our motive is not to restore and help that person, then it's only an accusation. Then the truth can only push that person away and not draw that person back to the place God wants that person to be. Yes, the Bible tells us to instruct, to rebuke, and to bring correction. I'm not asking you to refrain from doing this. But when the truth is addressed in love and true concern with godly intentions, your words will have a healing effect and bring freedom, even if you have to address some hard truths. Love and humility. Church, I want you to remember this. People who are hurting, they need to hear healing words that brings hope and encouragement and not words that inflict even greater pain or cause them to feel rejected. Isaiah 42, 3, and it's repeated again in Matthew 12, 20. It says, a bruised reed, he that is God, will not break, and a smoldering wick, he will not snuff out. This is the character of our loving God. It speaks of Jesus' tender, compassionate care for the weak, for the downtrodden, even towards the sinner who have messed up their lives. This is our Lord, and we are called to imitate him. Always remember this. Our words have the power to turn a healthy person into a hurting person, or to turn a hurting person into a healthy person. Choose your words wisely. Okay, we have now considered when to keep silent or when not to speak or, and what not to speak. But it's not enough to keep silent, is it? God has called us to be like him, to be communicators. So what does the Bible teach us? If we are to imitate him, what should our words sound like? What should our conversations sound like? Listen to these proverbs. Pleasant words are honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to our bones. Proverbs 16, 24. 
sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Proverbs 15, 4. The soothing tongue is a tree of life, means produces something that is good. Proverbs 10, 11. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, or it brings hope and encouragement to people's lives. Do these proverbs describe your conversation and words? A question I'm asking myself as well. Not just when we are in church, but when we are at home, when we are at work, when we are in school, wherever we are, do these proverbs describe our conversations? You know, in fact, we must learn to cultivate, uh, cultivate such words. We need to learn how to cultivate godly conversations. Proverbs often compare wise words to jewelry. It says our words are like silver and gold and so on. Proverbs 25, 11 and many other scriptures. What does this mean? You see, jewelry doesn't just turn up beautiful. The craftsman must work hard to make it beautiful and attract you. Likewise with our words, they need to be carefully chosen and considered and never ever spoken carelessly. We are told that to use our words to teach and instruct in wisdom, that's the next point. How, how do we use our words? To teach and to instruct wisdom. Ecclesiastes 12 9 says, Not only was the teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. So, if we are to instruct in wisdom, we must first of all seek wisdom, godly wisdom, and that is found in the Bible. We need to ponder and search the Word of God on a daily basis. And Proverbs 4, 7 says, Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and in all you are getting, get understanding. So after we acquire wisdom from the Word of God, we are instructed to share it, to use our words to impart wisdom to others. Parents are instructed to teach your children in Deuteronomy 6, 1 to 13. Older women are instructed to teach younger women in Titus chapter 2. Spiritual leaders were instructed to teach other believers, 2 Timothy 2. So we need to gain wisdom and use our words to instruct others in godliness. Amen? Earlier I said that we should not use words to crush people. Rather, God wants us to use words, words that heal people. Proverbs, Proverbs often refers to a soothing tongue, which literally means a healing tongue, a tongue that brings healing, words that brings healing, that contributes to a person's emotional health, those who suffer from the wounds of life, from insults, from slanders, from bereavement, from disappointments, from various failures, people who have messed up their lives, broken, angry, disappointed, abused. Now, this could be because of their own fault, of fault of others. However, these are the kind of people that God has called us to minister to. And Jesus said that he came for such people in Mark 2.17. And church, I want to bring a warning to you here. Most of the time, hurting people will speak hurting words. Angry people will speak angry words. Bitter people will speak bitter words. Critical people will fear, well, speak critical words because they do not know Jesus. But let us not give up and be discouraged. Rather know that we can change all that because God has called us into the ministry of healing the brokenhearted, setting the captives free, bringing hope to the hopeless. We have the word of life. Use it, church, because this has the power to change any person or any situation. Also remember, there's so much that you and I can do. God will do the rest. And if those that we are ministering to or counseling do not come, cooperate with the God of the counsel, 
don't be discouraged leave it to god all god requires from you and me to be obedient to him and to do what he calls us to do and do it with love and humility and we also called to speak up for those who have no voice proverbs 31 8 to 9 tells us speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves and goes on to say defend the rights of the poor and needy that's why jesus came into this world to rescue us when we were poor and needy when we were helpless when we were defenseless when we had no hope when we couldn't help ourselves when we did not have a voice jesus came to represent us he took our place on the cross so whenever we can we should speak up for those who have no voice look out for those who are marginalized bullied need of moral support be there for them speak up for them take up their cause when it's needed and when it's possible for us to do so as image bearers of god we have the ability the unique ability to think and to use our words in a way that would profit and bless others as well as ourselves and close with this jesus warned in matthew 12:35 to 37 that on judgment day we will have to, we will have to give an account for every idle word that we have spoken and we are told that we'll be judged or condemned or justified by our own words church this is serious this warning comes from the mouth of jesus himself and we should not take it lightly ephesians 4 29 instructs us let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers and David prayed in Psalm 141.3, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Church, let this be our daily prayer. Because our words have life and power to do good as well as to do evil. So let us use our words wisely. And use our words to bring glory and honor to our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand up and worship the Lord. Thank you.